Welcome to the Canadian Wildlife Federation and World Wildlife Day. My name is Sarah and I'm with the Centre for Global Education. And my name is Terry and I'm also with the Centre for Global Education. And we're so excited to have you all here today to celebrate World Wildlife Day. Now, World Wildlife Day started in 1973. 1973! That's amazing. You know what? I bet a lot of your school principals in 1973 were in grade three-ish. Oh, their principals didn't think about that. That would make sense. Absolutely. About grade three. So they're right where you're sitting now was when, how, when this started. Um, and it celebrates the day that the United Nations, which is 193 countries around the world, formed the United Nations. And together they came up with agreement that was working towards wildlife preservation and conservation. So they came up with a bunch of rules that everyone agreed to follow. And so they said, on this day from going forward, we're going to remember this agreement and celebrate wildlife all over the world. Isn't and that that's awesome? Totally. That's exactly what we're doing today. We're celebrating mm -hmm. wildlife all over the world. Very and, fitting. Mm -hmm. We have schools, in fact, joining us from, well, we have some very special schools joining us online. We have Mrs. Johnson's grade three class from Renfrew County, Ontario. Now they're joining us in a half an hour or so, but I said I'd give a special shout out oh, to when they log good in. good to have them here. Mm -hmm. But we also have other friends online joining mm. us on YouTube and then some here in our Zoom meeting. But you're both participating because Terry is also mm -hmm. on YouTube and he's bringing those questions over. So we want to say hi to Madame Slavin's grade three class. Hello, everyone there. Hello. And hello to Madame Sakella Geiger's grade three class who's joining us. Hello. Hello, hello. And then we have friends from Pena, Petawana, <laughs> Oops. Ontario. So from Herm Street, from Egan School, Rockfield School, Kalala Palmer. Oh my goodness. That's there a is lot of schools. Bayview Glen. And then we jump over to Kelowna. We have Rutland Elementary and Raymer and Shannon Lake. Oh my goodness, so many schools. We have mm -hmm. schools here in Edmonton, Malcolm Tweedle. We have university school in Calgary. Mm -hmm. And we have some home learners joining us from all across Canada. Oh my goodness gracious. But not only that, gracious. all across the world. No. We have home learners joining us from Turkey and from Hong Kong and from Ghana. I think I even a friend, saw a friend from Nigeria who was very active in our last conference on bats. He was amazing too. And so we want to encourage all of you to ask questions today. Our speaker is here and he has some amazing knowledge about wildlife that he's going to share from the Canadian Wildlife Federation. But we want you to ask your questions because he knows all this stuff. So he can mm -hmm. talk about wildlife all day, but he wants to know what you're interested in as well. So we're going to have lots of time for questions. Don't you worry. Now, we're joining here from Canada. And a part of being in Canada is recognizing our reconciliation process. And so we want to acknowledge that we, uh, we, the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that are on today, whether we're Ontario, or Alberta, or BC, that we're meeting on this virtual platform and we're connecting them all. We want to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands that we call home. And we do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between First Nations and Métis and all Canadian peoples and improving our understanding of Indigenous peoples and their cultures and their understandings of wildlife. I think that's mm -hmm. important today as we're celebrating that, mm -hmm. that we're looking to all the different understandings of wildlife and how we live on our lands and our responsibilities in taking care of them as good stewards, I mm -hmm. think is a good word for it, stewardship. So thank you everyone for joining us. Now, our question we were asking before, both on YouTube and here in the Zoom room was what is the loudest animal in the world? We had some great guesses. What were some of them we saw? Wolves? Wolves. Howler monkeys. Uh, sharks. Sharks. Uh -huh. uh, donkeys. Donkeys do seem donkeys. very loud. Uh, Sarah, I also guessed my dog, Max. Your dogs? Because he can sometimes wake me up in the morning. Oh, and annoying. And he's very loud. Yep. All right. But we're going to go to our wildlife specialist now, Milan, and he is going to give us the answer. Okay, Milan, who is right? What is the loudest wildlife animal? So I saw a lot of close answers, very close answers, a lot of whales. Well, there's one specific whale that is the loudest, and that's the sperm whale. So I saw some blue whales, some other whales, some lions, uh, and I actually saw the uh, snapping shrimp or pistol shrimp, and that's the second loudest animal in the world. So uh, shrimp, bonus points small. for that. Yeah, yeah, they they just they snap their claws so quick that uh, a bubble explodes, and it, it makes a really loud noise. Incredible. Incredible. 
So yeah. we're going to remember, remind all of our friends to keep themselves muted during our presentation. And then as soon as you have a question, we'll let you know that we're ready for you and we'll call you out by name. So please type your questions in the chat, uh, whether you're on YouTube or here. And Milan, I'd like to turn the floor over to you now to start to introduce us to this great topic. Great. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining me here. My name is Milan Conamancini. I work for the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And uh, our mission is just keeping green spaces uh, for wildlife, the habitats for us to enjoy, for us to see, and for all these animals to live. Uh, we really want to you know, make sure that humans and animals are living together in harmony and that we're not impacting each other's lives. Um, and yeah, it's just you know, a very um, beneficial goal, I think, <laughs> that uh, I think we can all benefit. And hopefully you did see some animals in your backyards. And I, I actually want to turn it, be, begin to turn it over to you. What did you see? Um, you, you received some uh, instructions, possibly from your teachers or the organization itself as to what you need to do to go out and check out your backyards to see evidence of wildlife in your own neighborhood. So I'd just like to, to invite you to put into the chat something you found. Um, and if, uh, if any of you wanna talk, you can just raise your hand and Sarah will call you out. All right, oh, I see, um, is it Make or Make? You have your hand up, you have brown hair. I see you, M-A-K-E. Did you wanna unmute? Here I can, there you go, bud, yeah. A chipmunk. A chipmunk, chipmunk. awesome. Where nice. are you joining from, us from today that you saw your chipmunk? British Columbia. British Columbia, wonderful. Thank nice. you so much. We have lots of rabbits are being put in on, from Spruce Grove. Ravens. We see lots of those out here. Some squirrels. Oh, raccoons from Mill Pond School. Chickadees. Chickadees. Nice. Oh, deer and coyote footprints. Ooh, so footprints. many people nice. saw wildlife. Somebody even saw a moose. A moose. Whoa. Oh, my goodness. Lynx that's and that's caribou. That. We have a lot of wildlife that's come Ooh, through. No kidding. Yeah. And I'm oh, glad to see that you. Skunk. Oh, <laughs> great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you might not see the animal directly, but you see their prints, you smell the skunk, you know, that you, wildlife is all around you. It's, it's great. Let's, uh, let's go to Anna, Anna and Anaya. Um, it's Ananya. Um, oh, Ananya, sorry. No, no problem. So um, I think I was just looking outside my balcony and I looked into the park and I saw something. It kind of looked like a deer. Cool, cool. Did you, uh, is there snow on the ground where you are? Is there mud? Um, uh, well, we get a lot of snow, but it keeps on melting away because, you know, spring is coming, but yeah. Cool. So another way to uh, see what evidence animals uh, leave behind is to look at their, their tracks. So if, even if you didn't see exactly what the animal was, we're going to go into it later. We're going to show, I'm going to show you different tracks that animals leave. Could I hear from Na Naya, please? Naya Wilson? You want to unmute yourself? Um, I'm at the beach and I saw turtles just ahead. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, I've seen some turtles in the ocean before. Arushi? At the back of our house, there's like this one squirrel that comes every day and they feed it bread and stuff. And Cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, so there's Lots of animals that are wild, you'll see that people will, um, they're, we're kind of living together, right? We're learning to live together. So you see pigeons, you know, in city areas, you see lots of squirrels in suburban areas. That's because humans have a lot of food in the area, right? So it's, it's difficult for animals to go out and seek and find food. But once you start feeding them, they start coming to the area regularly. It's not necessarily a good thing because the animals should be looking for food on their own. So once you start feeding it, it's going to keep coming to that same area expecting food. And it, they, in order to go to an area, an animal needs to use a lot of energy. So imagine when you're really tired and you're climbing up some stairs and you're like, oh man, I don't know if I can get up these stairs. This is so much energy. You know, that's kind of what animals are feeling every day. They're, they really have to conserve their energy. So uh, we, we sometimes leave out bird feeders, but we say that, you know, if you, if you are, you do have a bird feeder outside, Always, you should always be refilling it. You should always keep it, uh, keep it, keep food in there. Otherwise, birds are going to get used to the area, going to be finding food in that area, and then keep coming back. And then they might find an empty bird feeder, and then 
you know, they'll be wasting energy getting there and they might be too tired to go and find other food. So just be careful when you are feeding animals, especially wild animals in the woods, like moose and coyotes and things. Um, just be very careful because wild animals should stay wild. Uh, I see you just hatched five ducks and we had the opportunity to see them up close. That's super cool. Is it, was it a school project, uh, Davidson Dynamos 19? It's a big class, so I think it was. Cool, very cool. Ooh, Bobcat, I hope you, I hope you stayed uh, a safe distance away and uh, kept your small pets away from it. And Milan, we had some friends online who were sharing as well. Heather Walker shared that her students saw some feathers and footprints as evidence, very and they also saw some birds. And Madame Slavin's class saw, even saw some wolves and an elk. Whoa, whoa, cool, very cool. Yeah, just another uh, evidence of uh, something you should stay far away from, observe from a very safe distance. They don't uh, like you know, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you, you don't want the animal to see or smell you. You don't want, uh, because the moment an animal gets um, used to human presence, they start, you know, approaching you closer and closer and closer. And sometimes these animals say it's a bear, you know, or a wolf. They might not know that, uh, you know, hitting you is going to injure you. They might not understand the interaction between humans and animals. So we want to keep them afraid of humans. We want to make sure that we don't um, make it, make them accustomed to humans, make it so that they feel relaxed around us. So just, yeah, so when, you, uh, when you're observing wildlife, do so from a safe distance. Don't feed them, don't pet them. Even things that are cute, like a rabbit or a deer, you know, they, they, they should stay wild. And cool, white rabbit, yeah, lots of rabbits. Um, a lot of there, you'll see a lot of in in city type areas or suburban areas, you know, with the uh, places with backyards. You're going to see lots of rabbits, lots of squirrels, lots of birds. That's because we've gotten rid of most of the predators in these areas. So we've we've removed coyotes from the from the equation, and that their food source is now spreading wild. So uh, you're going to see a lot of those. Great. So any other uh, anybody else want to give an answer before I move on? I have uh, Naya. I have a friend that feeds birds. Yeah, I have a I have a bird feeder too. Yeah, it's it's good. Birds especially, they need lots and lots of food. And the the reason that we ask to put up bird feeders is because a lot of times in suburban areas, there's nothing but grass everywhere. So we we have this thing. It's called a monoculture, and it means that you. You're growing one type of crop and a lot of cities have nothing but grass but birds they need these plant they need flowering plants they need insects that feed off those plants they need the seeds that the plants grow and unfortunately there's a lot of places a lot of homes that don't have these seeds and plants so the the seeds that we put out they give a, uh, an extra bonus to the birds diet that they're not getting because of the way that we've built our cities all right, uh, I've got Jody McNabb, let's raise their hand there in the classroom. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself there, Jody? I saw a berry missing from trees. A, some what, sorry? Berries missing from trees. Oh, berries missing from trees, awesome, yeah. So that means that there's probably a bird or a squirrel or some other sort of small creature that has come and eaten that food source especially in the winter, there's so many animals that need lots and lots of energy because it's so cold out, you know? So you, when you get inside and you like, you, you drink a hot chocolate or you eat a snack and you warm up a bit, that's what animals do with food, but they can't go inside. They've got, they're nothing but outside, right? So they need way more energy to be able to stay warm and keep active. Can I hear from Jonathan that their hands raised? Thank you, uh, Jody McNabb's class. You just gotta unmute yourself there, Jonathan. I had you for a second. I saw a lion, a gorilla, and a penguin. Cool. Were you at the zoo? Yes. Very cool. Very cool. Where did you see them getting fed by the uh, zookeepers? I saw a lion yawn. <laughs> Very cool. So we uh, there's animals like lions and tigers and um, some other endangered species that actually need zoos to be able to, to live. 
So we are unfortunately building so many cities and roads and tearing down forests that we're ruining these animals' homes. So um, in order to get these animals to, uh, back up to the populations that they were, they get put into zoos and then bred, they, get, they have babies, those babies are put back into the wild in order to get the population uh, back up again. Uh, do you want, you wanted to say something, Tasneem? Yeah. Um, uh, once I saw a coyote, um, and the way we knew it was, it was a coyote is because the dogs were barking. And then when COVID-19 started, um, once we saw two coyotes in front, and we knew because the dark dogs were barking again. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. So coyotes, they used to live in a lot of the same areas that we live. And if you've got a forest or a big open field next to you, odds are there are some coyotes living in there. And uh, another way you can tell them is that when they get together and they start barking, it actually sounds a lot like laughter, almost like a hyena. You know, you, you hear uh, this like weird yipping noise um, that's really loud. And that's another reason you should kind of uh, you know, keep your pets inside. You should uh, keep dis keep a safe distance. Oftentimes, they'll have a territory, and if you see a coyote and they're walking along beside you, it means they're trying to escort you out of their territory. They're watching you leave their territory. Usually, they're not going to come and uh, investigate you or ask or uh, <laughs> uh, bother you unless they've been fed food before and they've associated humans to food. So as long as we keep that separation, you'll be safe. So Can I see we from... have lots more animals, but we need to move on. So if we didn't get sure. you, write it in the chat and we'll get you later. Cause I know we're gonna have so many questions. True, true. So thanks for okay. sharing okay. everyone. Great sharing. Great. All right, so I will go on to what I saw in my backyard. Well, so here actually we'll go over what wild and domesticated is. So a lot of you saw wild animals. So it's a chipmunk, a raccoon, some coyotes, things like that. And then the domesticated. So that would be things in your house. That would be, you know, uh, a, a cat, a dog, things you'd see in the zoo, like a lion or a, a tiger, things like that. And then you have things that fit in between, and that would be a rabbit. You know, there's wild rabbits still. There's there's also a lot of domesticated rabbits. So there are places where cats and dogs uh, are native or wild, but the majority of the world they're not. So we've, we've taken these dogs and cats and we bred them so that they become uh, kinder and nicer and maybe want to snuggle on our laps and things. And now they're not really suited for life outside. Um, so here, and we'll, we'll go over that a bit later here. So this is what I found in my backyard. This is uh, snow tracks. Yeah, so there's lots of, I have Russell Collins here. There are lots of stray cats that are wild. Um, unfortunately, lots of people let their cats outside and then they, they have babies outside and then those babies get, uh, just go outside and, and live in a wild life. So um, I, I would emphasize the, the, the need to keep cats inside uh, because they not only do they kill rabbits and, and birds and snakes and insects and pretty much everything, they also um, are not supposed to be outside. They're not native to our areas. So can anybody put in the chat here for using comparing the tracks that I have on the left and the tra and the the image that I have on the right? Can anybody try and guess what this animal is? It's kind of hard to see, and we're going to get some more information later to to show us what it really is. But you, so you just look at the tracks in the snow on the right, and then look at the tracks on the left, and then try and compare what what do those what do those tracks look like to you? I'll give you a second. Um, we have some deer, rabbits. What do you think, Terry? Oops. Raccoon, maybe? What's what's going on on YouTube? How, oh, how are our friends coming in there? Yeah, yeah. We don't Thanks. have any guesses yet, but I'm hoping that uh, Miss Laven's class, who've done lots of postings, that they mm -hmm. could post a guess. You know, my son is joining with Braden from Madame Slavin's class, and what? I know your daughter is joining us from Madame Sakella Geiger's class. So special shout out to our, our friends and family that are joining us today mm -hmm. online. Great. No, I okay, know so it's yeah, not so a I dinosaur. See. Sure. <laughs> yeah they so like an, what about sperm whales <laughs> mm, <laughs> they once had legs back a couple billion years ago but uh, <laughs> not, not, not right. any longer 
What other? Uh, so yes, yeah, so I see a lot of guesses here. Um, so a, a part of, of trying to figure out what animal's been in your backyard is using context. So that means that where was it found? When was it found? Uh, what else is around it that can tell you what was there? So, you know, I see some guesses like a lynx, a deer. I live in a, a suburb, so not anywhere near a large forest. So the odds of it being a deer or a, a wolf um, or a, a lynx or a large creature like a moose is very slim. So uh, I actually have here another bit of information. Um, it'll show you. I, I, I won't, uh, this will be the context in which I'm giving it. So can anybody tell me what the left and the right is? I think we're gonna get a lot of, oh, if we could only use emojis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah so there you go. Guesses. We have some great guesses online as well. Madame Slaven's class guessed a rabbit. Carly McLaren guessed a red fox. Heather Walker guessed a deer. Nice. Lots of poop answers. Yes, <laughs> yes. So that's what it is. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to tell the size from this picture, but it does look like deer scat, but it's smaller. So it actually is a rabbit. So you see here on the right is the pea, and on the left is the poo, and also known as scat. Uh, those of you with rabbits who have, or domesticated rabbits, you probably recognize the poo right away. And uh, yeah, so that's way, so I, I, right next to the tracks that I had above was this poo. And I was able to look at this scat and then compare it to um, a, another image. And I said, oh, that's a rabbit. So I was able to figure out, you know, there's a rabbit in my backyard. And then I started looking around and I saw some fruit missing off the trees. I saw some, some nibbles missing and uh, you see a trap. And I'm pretty sure I know where its den is, but I'm just gonna leave it alone, you know, let it, uh, let it live its life and things like that. So yeah, so good job, everybody. Uh, I see a lot of right guesses here. So yeah, so it's all about, you know, seeing what tracks that animals have left and, you know, they're very shy, the majority of animals. So you might not see them directly, but you will see evidence of them being there. All right, so let's go to the next slide. All right, has anybody heard of a food chain? You can just raise your hand or give us a, give me the thumbs up if you've heard of this. Great, yeah, sweet. Okay, so let's see, let's see, where does it start? It always starts with the sun, right? Because that's where we get all of our energy on earth is from the sun. Uh, at least on the surface, uh, not counting the the Earth's core. So I've got I've got sun that hits the grass. So you got like some some grass sticking up. If anybody wants to imitate these animals with me, this is the grass. And then we've got the grasshopper. So grasshopper is gonna let's say hop. Let's uh you know it's gonna hop, right? And then we've got the bluebird that eats the grasshopper. Yeah, yeah. You can do a yeah. You can do a bird a, a bird like this. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got the snake that eats the bird. And we got the owl. Um, hmm, how will we do an owl that's different from a bird? Yeah, that's good, that's good. I see Jonathan there. This is, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, owl, this is also good. Yeah, you got the, the big, big round eyes, yeah. And then, well, what happens to the owl once it dies? It, well, its body falls on the ground. If it isn't eaten by predators, uh, another a scavenger or something, uh, then it's going to get eaten by these things called decomposers. So usually there are very, very tiny little bacteria that we can't even see. Um, and then other times you've got mushrooms that grow on them. So mushrooms are actually decomposers. And then those decomposers become, uh, get, um, fuel the grass. They, they use the, uh, they create energy for the grass to use. And then it starts all over again. So you've got this big cycle of things here. So has anybody um, seen any of these things in action? Maybe two, or let's say three or more. Has anybody seen three or more of these or have uh, evidence, maybe not these ones specifically, but like something that would eat bugs and then something that would eat the thing that eats bugs. If anybody wants to type in chat. Oh yeah, let's, uh, yeah. I, have, uh, I have some hands up here. Mushrooms growing on old logs. Great. So yeah, so there's, uh, they're decomposing the, the logs. Adelina, did you see anything that would have eaten the grasshopper, like a bird? Uh, the bats, yes. Lots of, uh, there's lots of bats, a lot of places. Um, 
predators that eat bats would probably also be an owl. I saw a dragonfly, see a lot of grass, birds. Yeah, bunnies eat grass. Yeah, exactly. And then there's predators that'll eat the bunnies. A hawk eating a small bird on top of our garage. Very cool. So yeah, so that's a, a bird. Um, a hawk is an apex predator. It's like the top of the food chain. Nothing, nothing eats a hawk, you know? Like nothing can catch a hawk. They're so good. Mushrooms, grass, grasshoppers, birds, owls, cats, hogs, eagle. Wow, you so you see you saw the full the full food chain. Awesome, Noah and Zabby. Glad to see you saw all of them. Great. I actually, so, um, I actually saw an owl in uh, my community. It was flying around, and I saw it um, catch a little grass snake. Cool. Very cool. So yeah, so you saw. Do you, have you ever seen anything that the snake might have eaten? No. Like a bird or a mouse. They also, the, the smaller snakes also tend to eat insects too. Yeah. Ooh, saw a snake egg. Cool. Did you see the nest? Or how did you know it was a snake egg, uh, Prescott, Co Cooper Haven, Copper Haven? Uh, mice, birds. We have seen many of these. Very cool. And we have Riker said on the YouTube channel, he said that he saw a bird eating a grasshopper. Whoa. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so you see the direct relationship here. The birds eat this. Yeah, sweet. So what do you think would happen when one of these elements is removed? So one of these animals say, um, you know, there's no more, there's no more birds in the area for whatever reason. What would happen to the grasshoppers? Do you think that there would be more grasshoppers or there would be less grasshoppers if there was no more, no more birds? Oops. Smaller snakes, yeah, smaller snakes eat insects for sure. So what would happen if we if we removed either the snake or the bird? Yeah, okay, great. So there would be more grasshoppers because there isn't any birds to eat the grasshoppers. So then the grasshopper population grows really big and you'll see, you know, there's no more birds. So there's just grasshoppers everywhere. And then you look at, you look and then it turns out they're eating all the, 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 the grass. You know, and then you have no more grass. And then what happens to the grasshopper population? Well, it starts going down because they don't have grass to eat. So there's a kind of control because there's this chain. There's the bird population kind of controls the grasshopper population. Yeah, it breaks the chain, exactly. So then, you know, there's too many grasshoppers. There's no birds. What would the snake eat? Well, maybe they can eat the grasshoppers, <laughs> but uh, yeah, exactly. Jen Mills, exactly. It's a population cycle. It's called uh, like, yeah, um, um, oh man, I forget what it's called, but uh, yeah, population cycle. It's like a, there's like a big boom. And then when the play, the, the, the environment can't handle it, it kind of goes down and then it goes back up and kind of levels out a bit. Yeah. Ants sometimes eat other ants. Very true. So yeah. So when there's very little amounts of food available. Sometimes animals will resort to cannibalism. So that means that they'll eat their own kind, you know, if there's no, if there's no other food available. Uh, we see this with birds eating birds. Um, and uh, yeah, like even, even deer actually are the, something called an opportunistic carnivore. That means you think of deer, you know, you're thinking, oh, they're going to eat fruit and they're eating plants. But if there's meat available, a deer is going to eat it because it contains this like a, a lie, high amount of energy. Uh, all right. So we talked about breaking the chain um, and maybe domesticated animals being in the wild. So we see here the cat, the domesticated cat has taken over the roles of the snake and the owl. And this is because the cat is a hunting machine. It is so good at hunting and killing animals. And not only is it good at hunting and killing animals, but it does it for sport. So oftentimes a cat will hunt a bird and not even eat it. It'll just leave it there. So, and a bird and a, 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 a cat can kill dozens of animals in a, in a single day. And they actually have done studies and they find that in North America, cats, domesticated cats, the cats that we have in our house, yeah. that we have outside, outside. Yeah, uh, they, they turn, it turns out they kill about 2 billion small mammals and birds a year. So 
they, they are completely ruining these small animals you see in your backyard. And not only, you know, they, they're not doing it for food because we give them food at home. Uh, Make, you had a question? Do you want to unmute yourself so you can talk? Um, oh, go ahead. Um, once I saw a grasshopper, um, sorry, not a grasshopper, a dragonfly on um, my grandpa's car. Cool, very cool. Yeah, grasshoppers are are super cool. They uh, they are definitely their primary consumer, so they're they'll get eaten by almost anything. Did you have a Did you have something to say, make? Uh, make? Yeah, you it wasn't me? a grasshopper. It was a dragonfly. Oh, dragonfly. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, dragonflies actually eat mosquitoes, which are really cool. Yeah, uh, go ahead, uh, Mac. Uh, me. Yeah. I heard that there is the largest snake in Australia. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a lots of animals and dangerous animals and large snakes in Australia. So the reason for that is because uh, when you when like I live in Canada and the the winters are so cold. So there's only a certain amount of creatures that can survive this cold and they need to adapt to survive this cold. Whereas in Australia, the winters, they barely get snow. So it's, it's very warm, it's warm all season long. So in order to compete with each other, there's such a high competition because they're not, most of them aren't dying out because of the cold. So the, the way that these creatures survive is they get bigger, they get stronger, they get more teeth, they get poison, they get uh, all these cool things that you, you know, you think of when you think of all these animals in Australia, you know, you see the size of the spiders and it, they're like the size of my head, you know? <laughs> and the, the reason for this is because the weathers are so warm and for such a long period of time that there's, there's very little competition. So yeah, so it's, uh, anybody else have a, have a Jason Morang here for, with a question? Um, it wasn't exactly about the food chains. I had a question about when you were identifying animals. Sure. Um, so wolves and coyotes, do wolves have black wolves and coyote, but black lips and um, coyotes don't have black lips? Uh, there is using colors to find, to, to, to figure out which animal it is, is very difficult because like people, we all have different skin colors animals too. They have different fur colors, there's different colorations, there's different spotting, the lips have different colors, the tongues have different colors. It's really hard to tell. So usually what they use is they use the, the shape of the skull, the size of the snout, the um, I think the placement of the eyes for coyotes and wolves, and then the size. The size is very important. Yeah. A wolf's paw is going to be like sometimes the size of my hand, you know, and a coyote's paw is going to be closer to a small mid-sized dog. So that's how you'd tell. The coloration, it's used mostly for like birds because they have such distinct coloring. But if you look at, you know, like you're a cat, a domesticated cat or a domesticated dog, you see how wide of range of colors there are. Um, do we have any other questions before I like, move this on? This is McNabb's class might have a class that, uh, question. Uh, they yes. their hand. Yeah, go ahead. Jody McNabb class. Nope. Okay. Well, it, while they're getting ready, maybe Jonathan has a question. He could. It's Go kind ahead. of cringe why the cats that like, kill and do not do anything. Like that's no reason to do that. So cats, it, they don't they don't really know better, right? So they they've been uh, the way that they've grown up. This is what their life. They, they they think that they need to attack. Right, so they think that they need to feed. So there's there's animals. They're they're. It's called being driven by instinct. Right. So they throughout their entire generation. So their their parents and their grandparents and their great 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 grandparents. You know, they all hunted to survive, and that that need to hunt is so strong. It's like you know when you're when you're really hungry and you need to eat something. The cats kind of have that all the time. So they they feel like they need to be hunting for their food. And then they see something in the bushes, you know, their, their instinct takes over and they attack it. Even if they're full, they just have this, this strong desire to attack it. 
So the best bet to keep your cats safe and to keep other wildlife safe is to keep your cats inside. Uh, let's see here, is there a question in the chat here? No. Shrikes try to chase fish, they don't actually eat humans. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, so yeah, most animals like sharks even, you know, there or other other predator species, most of the time they don't actually want to engage in a fight. Uh, they'll, they'll most of the time they'll run away. Um, so they mo these animals like we were talking about animals conserving energy, you know, how they're always tired and they're always trying to trying to survive. Well, predators are the same way. It takes a lot of energy to fight something to be able to to take something down and eat it, you know. So they they're going to avoid that at all costs unless they know it's a fight they can win. So they're, if, they, if they see they're approaching something and they see that it's going to put up a fight, they're scared. They'll, they'll get scared and they'll run away. You know, this isn't worth my energy. This isn't worth my time. I'm going to find easier prey. So that's how they view humans. They see us as a, a threat. They don't know how to, how to, how to see. They don't, they don't understand what, we, uh, what threat we pose. But by feeding them and by getting them accustomed to us, it kind of uh, ruins that, that fear and that, that, uh, that they, they start viewing us as not a threat. So as cities expand, and I mean, I live in outside of Edmonton, and the city just keeps growing. What is that doing to our wildlife? Yeah, so there, it does a lot of things. So it, it basically, it squeezes them into smaller and smaller areas. So you'll notice maybe uh, there was a forest nearby you or an empty field that soon became housing or condos. You know, unfortunately, that was uh, housing or condos for animals. And now we're kind of taking it over. So what happens to those animals? They get displaced. They move into the city. They move into backyards. They move under your deck, you know. And then in the case of predators, because we, we are so afraid of them and we don't want them here, most of the time these predators end up dying off or getting killed or trapped or relocated. Uh, so and then there's something else that happens. It's called habitat fragmentation. It's like if you were in your house and you divide, drove a line down the middle of your house and said, oh, you can't go over to this other side because this is their property. This is somebody else's property. Yeah, so, it, so this is what happens when you've got you know, a, a big stretch of forest and you've got somebody coming in that says, well, we're just going to develop part of it. You know? We're just going to leave most of the forest, but we're going to put a big mall in the middle of it. You know? So that's, that, that's called habitat fragmentation. So these animals, they're not going to go into the mall. <laughs> they're not going to. They're not going to approach this area. So they they end up living instead of living in this gigantic forest. They now become living in two separate forests, and then the population in that first forest becomes um, it becomes smaller. So you instead of having a hundred deer, you have fifty deer divided up. And then what happens when you've got a small population? Well, you get lots of diseases. You get lots of uh, inbreeding, it's called. So it basically, the, the, the genetic material that's available isn't super strong, and you get weaker and weaker deer over generations. And we see this a lot in areas where they have something called wasting disease. And these lots of the deer all across Canada have this thing called wasting disease. that's actually ruining the deer population. And this is because of, uh, of habitat fragmentation and um, habitat loss. Uh, Jonathan, you have a question? I have a forest behind my, my fence. Cool. Yeah. And do you see lots of animals there? There's rabbits there. I only see birds, rabbits, and coyotes. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully you keep your pets inside to keep them away from those coyotes if you do have them. And then, uh, you know, you can probably see more evidence of the animals being there than the animals themselves. So you probably do have deer there, but they're a bit too scared to, to approach you, you. And there could be other animals like uh, groundhogs or possums or things like that. But because they're so afraid of humans, you just don't see them. I've only seen rabbits, coyotes, and birds. I've, maybe there might be some stuff underground. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's some animals that only come out at night. And since we're active during the day, we just never see them, you know, and then, yeah. 
Sorry, we have uh, we have many students here joining, and they have the advantage that they can just unmute. Now we want to give our schools a bit of a chance to to talk as well. So we have Mrs. Hicks' class, we have the Dynamos, of course, and we have Matt Chicken and Mrs. Swat. Uh, Sawatsky's class. So if you're in a school with other students around you and you have a question, we want to make sure that you have a chance to ask as well. Now, as you get ready, um, maybe we'll start um, with, uh, with Ms. Hicks' class. So someone maybe come up and, and wait and then we can unmute you. But we have a question coming in from YouTube. Go ahead, Terry. We do have a question from Ms. McLaren's class. Uh, about a deer noticed in our area. On the weekend, we saw a print of the antlers in the snow. Should deer not have already shed their antlers by now? Yeah, I know that uh, I'm not too certain, to be honest. Uh, I know that there are um, two types of, it depends on the deer. I know that caribou females keep their antlers year round. So maybe there might be, um, hmm. You know, I, I don't know. I, sorry, I don't have the answer to that question, but uh, I can answer it maybe later if there's some way to get you, uh, get you an answer. Um, I, can, I can look it up for you. Wonderful. Okay, so we have Miss Hicks' class is ready, and then Miss Mills' class will be after that. So Miss Tick, uh, over to you, to your student there. Has an animal? Animal, has a, animal um, came in sick with eating a uh, like not a okay mushroom. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? As an animal, um, has a cat came in uh, okay. sick with mushrooms? Um, eating a not poison okay, mushroom. yeah, poison mushroom. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. So as you as maybe i've explained a bit that it's it's a bit dangerous for animals just to be living outside <laughs> so it, it's animals have to deal with all the things that uh you would have to deal with if you were surviving in the wild so eating something that they don't know is necessarily good for them can lead to them dying they get lots of parasites which is like little uh like bugs and things living inside them um and it makes them very sick so yes these animals cats dogs deer rabbits they're often dying in very unusual ways that we wouldn't even imagine, you know, even just sometimes they starve to death because there's no food around. Sometimes they freeze, you know, the life of a wild animal is very difficult. And that's why we need to keep their populations high so that these little, these, these incidents of them not finding food or freezing won't reduce their population so much. So we need to keep up these, these green spaces in order so that the populations are high so that these big events don't ruin them. All right, thank you for that great question. Now over to Miss Mills' class. We just want to come and unmute. Hi, yes, um, I have, uh, am I on? Yes, yep. go ahead. Okay. Uh, my class is actually a virtual class. So they are all watching my screen at home um, and uh, they're sending me questions from home. Uh, one of my students uh, has asked two questions, actually. Um, they're curious about what wild animals eat, and they are also curious about what an apex, what does the word apex predator mean? Sure. Yeah, so I'll start with the apex predator. So apex is, I think, a Latin word, and it means the top, the tip top. So we kind of picture this, uh, these, these chains as a pyramid. So um, the, the, it goes down, right? At the bottom is the grass, and then right above it is the insects or the things that eat the grass, like rabbits. And then above that is a predator, like the snake. And then above that, at the peak, at the apex, which means like the tip top, is the apex predator. So that means it doesn't have um, predators itself. So unfortunately, a lot of apex predators are actually not apex predators because we're the apex predator. So we are the peak in the world. We, we can hunt anything. We can take down anything. And unfortunately, we're abusing this. You know, we're, we're taking down more animals than, uh, than we can to keep their, their populations up. Uh, as far as what animals eat, it's 
almost anything and everything you see outside, something eats it. So like from the plants, like I said, the grass to the plants, to the things that eat the grass and the plants and little creepy crawlies you see crawling around on the ground, like uh, insects and spiders, everything gets eaten um, except for the apex predator. So the apex predator, sometimes we eat them, you know, <laughs> sometimes like uh, we'll eat, uh, you know, exotic meats and things like that. And unfortunately, you know, exotic meat trade is, is very uh, common across the world. And this is a, one of the big reasons also why, why, uh, why some animals are going extinct. So I s thank you for that answer and for joining us online to, to Miss Mills' class. Um, we have some questions. Miss Brand's class, who I know is loading under the wrong name, but would you like to ask that yourself in Miss Brand's class about the habitat or would you like us to ask it for you? Come on, in. wonderful. Here, Owen, we're gonna let him try to ask his question. Okay, come right up to and talk really loud. Perfect. Um, yes, on the habitat disappears for every animal. How long do you think they would be able to live? Sorry, could you repeat the question? So if the habitat disappears, how long do you think and the animal could live? Right. So if you're, if their habitat is destroyed, how long can they live? That's if I understood the question. Does that make sense? Is that what you asked? Okay. So it really depends. Um, sometimes, you know, a, a, a habitat getting destroyed is like a very slow process. So it might be as uh, simple as, you know, come, someone coming in and cutting down the forest. And then unfortunately, there's no more food for the animals and they could very likely die by the next season. So if you're, you know, if an animal is there the one summer, forest gets cut down, the next summer they won't be there. They'll, they'll have died. Uh, other times with habitat fragmentation, so say they have like a little bit of space to live, but they don't have a big enough space with enough food, then we'll get that, that, that drop in the, in the amount, of pe amount of animals that exist. So it'll be a slow downward decline as they start eating up all the food that is available. So they might survive for a season, so they'll be there the next summer, but then the summer after that, they'll be a lot less. And then the summer after that, a lot less as their food slowly disappears. That's a good question. There's a few of the, that question came up a few times on the chat, so I'm glad we were able to get it in. Thanks for asking it. So now our friends at Dynamo, DRE Dynamo 19 have a question. Woohoo! I see them cheering. Over to you guys. We are wondering, um, how does hunting affect um oh affect this topic wildlife wildlife yeah, okay so there is there are things that are responsible there's things called responsible hunting and there are organizations that make sure that people are hunting responsibly so while i mentioned that we are the apex predator we are actually part of the food chain so while we sometimes abuse this power because we can, we can, you know, we could, if we wanted to, we could just kill every animal in the world, you know, but we, oh, thankfully we don't. So um, we need to be part, we need to understand our place within it. So things like deer that are very overpopulated in some places, meaning that there, there's a lot of food source and they, car they keep eating, they keep eating the food source and the deer population keeps growing and growing. We see this and we're like, oh my God, if we don't stop hunt these deer, they're going to eat all their food. They're going to eat all their own food. And then, you know, the population starts going up and nobody's hunting, nobody's hunting. Oh, the food's gone. Whoa, oh, the deer population crashes. And that can actually lead to the entire death of the deer population. So hunters, instead of it, they see that it's going up. They see that the deer population is going up and they're like, okay, you know what? We need to level it out. We need to make it so that it's like this on the curve so that there's not too many. So they're not eating all the food possible. So, um, so hunting and fishing does play a role, but unfortunately there are a lot of places and a lot of people that over hunt and overfish. Now our friend Arushi from Mill Pond had probably the most important question that I've seen come up so far. So maybe Arushi, if you wanted to unmute and ask your question, I think it's awesome. I had multiple questions, so the last one that I did. Yeah, about protecting. Okay, um, my question was, how can I help to protect my life? Great, I am so glad you asked that because there are a few things here. I'm gonna share my screen again. 
So what can you do? So uh, as we saw with the food chain, uh, I think the I think you know there are some people who might have different opinions, but I think the most important thing we need to do is protecting that bottom level of the food chain. So getting making sure that there's lots of different plants, making sure that there's lots of different insects, making sure that there's lots of different birds available. So those those first three levels are so important because of these these higher levels all depend on it. So at every level, the thing depends on the thing before it. So as long as there's lots of plants, there's going to be lots of rabbits, lots of insects, lots of things that are eating the plants and insects, and then uh, so on and so forth. So we give a couple real examples of things you can do in your classroom, at your house, and uh, things like that. So what really helps a lot is planting flowers. So you might not think that flowers are, you know, they're, they're just there to look at and smell and look pretty, but in fact, they're food for insects. So, and then what eats insects, but birds and everything else. So protecting, uh, getting, planting flowers for pollinators is excellent. Leaving the leaves, meaning that when you're, when the leaves fall off the tree and the, the land on the ground, um, a lot of times insects and mice and small mammals will use these leaves as hiding so they'll, they'll crawl around underneath the leaves and they'll, they'll save, I, I see there, everybody, don't worry, I'm gonna get to you. <laughs> uh, so they'll crawl around under the leaves and they'll use these to sleep over winter. So uh, by, by not picking up your leaves and throwing away all these animals and insects, you can protect wildlife. Uh, in the same idea, having a no mow zone. So the animals like tall grasses and lots of bushes and trees and things. So by leaving an area of green space that's not mowed, that's that you let grow wild, would help enormously for animals and plants and birds. As we mentioned, keep cats inside. Uh, we have a great program with Canadian Wildlife Federation across Canada for 15 to 18 year olds called Wild Outside. Um, and then there's a, an application called iNaturalist. And that's like you're helping scientists directly by uploading pictures onto a website of animals and plants you see. So we can keep track of what animals are popular in which areas and not. So I see uh, uh, Jonathan here, you had a, you're, you were waving your hand there. You wanna? What's the, what's the biggest desert animal? The biggest desert animal, hmm. I would think probably the camel because there's a lot of animals that are not able to survive in the desert for long periods of time. So the camels will drink water at one location and then move to another. And there's not many animals that can do that because they don't have the way of storing, uh, storing water. Now, I just wanted to give a shout out to Miss Mills class again. We, she just uh, asked a question recently, but she is saying that in her class that they planted over a hundred spring balls for pollinators to come to their outdoor garden. And those awesome. are some awesome things that you can do, not only in your, I mean, with COVID, a lot of us are still at home, but so we, we can be at school and do projects, but we can also be at home and think about what can I do in my own backyard to help yes, the wildlife yes. that I see. Exactly. And actually uh, the Canadian Wildlife Federation can get your garden certified as a pollinator friendly garden. You get like a little, a little plaque you can put up and uh, we'll recognize you as benefiting pollinators and plants and animals. All right, and I know we had another question come in off of YouTube. All right, so Parker had a question and he is wondering why killer whales are not human predators. Um, meaning they, they don't attack humans? I, I think that he, uh, that would probably be along the lines of the question okay. why they don't attack yeah. maybe even more often or they don't have humans as part of their like primary food source. Got it, got it. Well, the, the probably the main reason is that humans don't live in the water. So they are not accustomed to seeing us. You know, they, they don't think of us as prey. As we, when we go back to that idea of animal instinct, there's animals that have in their head this is what I'm eating, you know, and for, for orcas or killer whales, which we try not to use because it gives this, this bad, a bad uh, name to them, right? They're, they're orcas. So they're not actually, you know, all animals are killers because they, all animals kill. So just calling them a killer whale, it kind of, you know, it, it makes them, makes, makes them feel bad, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, an orca in its mind, it says, I'm eating seals. And they'll hunt seals and they'll go after seals. And then occasionally, 
you know, they might see something like a shark. Sharks eat seals all the time too. And then when you're when you're paddling on your surfboard out into the wake from underneath, that looks a lot like a seal, you know. And and when you're swimming from underneath, that looks like a seal too. So in fact, like sharks and killer whales, they don't actually have uh, they they don't think to eat humans, but they might accidentally eat us sometimes. Um, so they'll, they'll, they'll uh, a shark or a, a whale, a, ki a killer whale, will will do something sometimes called like a test bite, and they'll just they'll just nip you, you know, they'll they'll they'll, they'll see what happens when they bite you, and then they'll you 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 start getting angry and you you hit it and it, it it'll swim away because it's too scared because they seals usually don't fight back, you know, so uh, and then they won't actually eat you, they'll just you know do a little bite. <sighs> Oh, some little nibble, a little tasty. Yeah, yeah. Um, Everyone likes snacks. That's exactly. Cool. I think children can understand that bit, but people need to have a little snack. Now, we are in our last minute here, and I really wanted to, to and look closer at your last question on that slide there is, what are some of your ideas? Because I think that it's important that we walk away from today, World Wildlife Day, thinking, I can make a change. I can make a change to help preserve wildlife in my area, in my school, or in my community, or at my home. And I saw in, in the chat that Saul from, from Argyle here in Edmonton, uh, or at least around the Edmonton area, had said that um, my sister and I are planting the butterfly and bee garden. Stuff awesome. like that. Awesome. Things that you can do. Planting garden. Very cool building bathhouses. I know we've talked about baths with Canadian Wildlife Federation before. What are other fun ideas? Even Milan could maybe you could help seed a few ideas of things that they could do, you know, later today. I mean, you said the no mow zone, and that's when people don't have little areas of their gardens where they don't mow the lawn. Exactly. But yeah. Have you heard of, I see hands up in Miss, um, in Miss Brandt's class, I think, and if you I know that this sounds not awesome, but we can definitely translate for you. But what are some of the, some of the other ideas? Oh, uh, I see the dy Dynamo's 18 who haven't spoken yet have a few hands up. There's a dude in a shirt at the front, um, brown shirt. Come on up. We want to hear from Dynamo's 18. All right, come on up with your, yep, there you are. Okay, what's your idea of something you could do? Well, we just got unmute you here. I wanted to ask a question. Go ahead. What's the most dangerous animal in Canada? Whoa. In most Canada? Ooh. Yeah. Um, hmm. Ooh. Um, hmm. That's a tough one. Uh, I would say um, a moose, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that's not really what you'd expect, but actually moose are really scary and uh, they're huge and you know there's sometimes you're driving a car and there's like a little sign that says moose you know if you're driving your car and you hit a moose you're not walking away the moose is walking away mm -hmm. the, the moose does not get hit it gets hit by a car and it's fine <laughs> it keeps walking you know but unfortunately you not so lucky and your car might be ruined so um, not only that but in this thing called rutting season when a moose is looking for a mate uh, then the the moose will the male moose if they see anything that they think is a threat they'll charge and they will attack you um they don't care about saving energy they're angry <laughs> so um I thought Jonathan, were the most dangerous. In, in the world yes but not in canada the canada the question was in canada but yes hippos are the most dangerous animal in the world they they kill more and more um more people than sharks and lions and wolves combined well, that is a positive note to leave us on. <laughs> Just we have lots of comments coming in about planting trees and building birdhouses. And also one really important one that came off YouTube was that sometimes it's not about building something or making something, it's about not doing something. So she was saying yes. that uh, her class is practicing not pulling on uh, branches off trees because Ooh. it disturbs birds who might be nesting there. And other, yeah, yeah. so I think that we, sometimes we think that we have to do something but actually we have to stop doing other things, if that makes sense. So anyways, I wanna thank everyone for such brilliant, amazing ideas. If you have some more, you're welcome to write a little list down and send them in and we'll share them on our Instagram and YouTube and we'll let everyone know what you're doing and, or what your school's doing to help wildlife on World Wildlife Day. I wanna thank our guest, Milan, 
awesome job, Alon, and talking to all of our students from across Canada and some of our friends joining us from around the world. Uh, thank you to our friends who joined us on YouTube. It was great to have you involved in the conversation today. So everyone, the takeaway is you too can help wildlife all around you, whether it's in your backyard or it's in the mountains or it's in the oceans, you can play a part in changing wildlife today. So thank you everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful day. A wonderful day. We'll see you again soon. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye. 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 Bye.